Welcome to Inside Out Boys with your host, Cody Bass. Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Um, big hello to all the new subscribers. Thank you for subscribing. If you're new here and you want to have some fun, look at some outboard repairs and get a little silly, click that subscribe button. If you like what you see, hit that likey thing and do all that ubi tubi 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 stuff. So, we just had a awful abused little motor in my last video. Um, I've got three. The guy brought me in three um, 30 horse, both Evan Rude and Johnson. Two Rudes, one Johnny. Um, no, two Rudes, one Johnny. Um, so anyway, um, the one we got here, he, these are commercial used motors, but they're used in, I think it's a fairly unique fishery here in the States. I'm sure there's other places that do it, probably Washington State, Oregon, maybe even some a little bit in California. Um, if any of you states down there do this, let me know. I ju I'm just curious. Maybe even in Florida and uh, uh, maybe up in Maine. I don't know. But anyway, um, we have these big salmon runs that come here to Kodiak Island. Um, they come by the millions, five, 
five different kinds. And, um, you know, most of them are caught in big salmon commercial boats, saners with big hydraulics and giant, giant nets that they stretch out and they have these big powerful uh, skiffs that go along with the big saying boats and they, they rope them salmon, they make a big circle somehow and I don't know nothing about fishing commercially. Um, but anyway, they scoop them up by the, by the thousands. And, uh, but one unique fishery that I'm not sure how much goes on around in the States anymore is what they call set netting. And that's basically where a, a group of people, they're normally a family oriented operation, but out in the remote parts of, of the island, um, there's these fisheries where they basically do it with aluminum skiffs and outboard motors. Um, and all it is is they run a net, and this is the best I understand it, they run a net from the beach or close to the beach straight out from the shoreline. And then they go out there every so many hours and the net on the top has corks on it and they see the corks shaking and all, they know they got fish in the net. And they go out there with their little skiffs and outboards and pick those salmon out of the net. And, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that. Um, but the bottom line is they use 30, 40, 50, 70 horsepower outboards depending on the size of their skiffs. And uh, from what I understand, there's even a few of them that have been doing this for decades that uh, still use wooden skiffs um, to do this operation. And, uh, but I get a lot of business from them and, uh, and usually their motors are hammered. I mean, they, they work them. That's, that's their living. That's how they're making a living. So uh, they work them hard. Um, and they have other equipment. I know that when the nets are out there after so long, they fill up with seaweed and jellyfish and they have to bring the nets up and they use pressure washers to clean all the jellyfish and seaweed and stuff out of them. So there's probably a whole lot more to it than, than what I know. And it's from what I understand, they catch the fish over a period of days and they put them out in a, in a storage thing that is floating out in the, in the bay. They transfer them into there and it's refrigerated, uh, uh, refrigerated seawater so it keeps the fish nice and fresh. And then a big boat just goes around the island from set net site to set net site sucking up those fish out of that big refrigerated uh, seawater system. And then they bring them to town and uh, take them to the canneries to be processed. So it's kind of a, a unique fishery. Uh, it's been going on here ever since I've lived here for about 40 years. And from what I understand, it goes way back. It's a very um, traditionally traditional and old school fishery. But uh, so I got three from uh, this particular commercial fisherman. They're 30s. And uh, this one ain't that bad. Um, it was the better looking of the three. You understand? Let's look. So, actually, it's not not that bad. But he said none of the three would run. Um, but it's not overall that bad. So, yeah. Okay, so I took the spark plugs out and I got a spark checker hooked up. The spark plugs look pretty good. Um, one's a little darker than the other. That's the bottom plug. It's a little oily. That's the top plug. It looks a little better. They are QL77JC4s. Um, Yep, both of them. QL77 JC4. So they look pretty pretty good. Looks like it's been firing. So if you watch right there, these two wires going to the plug wires. The, the recoil on this thing's real sticky, so I'm gonna have to take it off, soak it in my tank, or take it apart, lube it. Normally just soaking it in my tank for a day or so helps. But watch right in there. See how that recoil goes back in. But so we got spark on both cylinders. Let me get my compression gauge. Okay. 
I got my compression gauge screwed in the bottom cylinder and you can see it's on zero. I got my half Milwaukee hooked up to the flywheel. I took the recoil off and I'll show you what I did with that in just a second. But let's get a compression reading on the bottom. We are looking at about 115. Right at 115 on the bottom. Let's see what we get on the top. Give me the hard time. Hard times. Everybody got it. What do we got? What do we got going? See, want to screw in there for some reason. There it goes. Just had to get it. Had to get it. All right, you on the Spanish. I speak of the Spanish. Okay, let's do the top. It's on zero. Let's see what you do. It is about 115. 115 top and two bottoms. So we got some spark. We got some compressionis. You understand us? I speak it as Spanish. Um, so, we've got us some compression. We got us some spark. Now, I didn't really get a good rundown on uh, what was wrong with all three of these engines because he didn't know me. He said, I think one of them was a PN and one of them wouldn't stay running and blah blah. blah. So, he don't know. This thing might just have water pump problems. It's a little dirtier in the back. Mm. Not a little bit more salt and crud. But hey, it's got sparking so far. Now I'll show you what I do with these uh, recoils. I just pull the, the line all the way out and then I Tie a slip knot or put a jam, some kind of jam nut in there or whatever. And I just take them old nasty things and, and then I'll let that soak for a while. And then what I'll do is, is undo the slip knot or whatever and just pull it in and out, in and out, in and out, soak it back some more, pull it in and out, in and out. And it helps clean up. This tank is full of goodies. I've got goodies in there, man. That ain't water. It ain't holy water, but it's getting it's pretty close. I got salt away in there. I got a little bit of sprinkle of nitric acid in there. I got a lot of oil and stuff from these engines, all the penetrating fluid when I spray it in there. It's in there. It's in the pudding. Proof is in the pudding. It's in there. Clean that stuff right up. And they love you for it in the morning. All right, so now we got a conundrum to dumb. Do I just put the plugs back in it? Put on the recoil uh -huh. and try and start it and see if it'll run, see if it won't run. Should I pop off that old carbon in nature and see if it's all dirty? Mmm. The sessions, the sessions. Well, what I'm going to do right now, I think. You want to stay? Get your back over here. Oh. Just a problem. Okay, so. What I think I'm going to do is I'm going to let that 
recoil soak for an hour or two and then do the thing on it. See if she loosens up real good. Then I'm going to shoot a little bit of the only two cycle pop starter I use. They pay me nothing. I get no royalties, I get no money. Heck, you can't even see what it is so dirty. It says TriFlow Superior Lubricant. The best outboard tech I ever noted. Told me on two stroke motors, don't be using no Heather, Elizabeth, Ether, Heather, 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 Ether. Don't be using that in a two stroke motor. He said, ain't good for it. He said, use mixed gas, 50 to 1. Spray it in the throat to pop start. Well, then he went to school. Down in Trent, Washington. And the OMC folks down there at the training center said, OMC now approves that for a pop starter in two cycle motors. So that's the only thing I use inside the cylinders. And if I want to use it as a starting fluid down the throat of the carburetor, that's what you use. It has oil in it. It has flammable stuff in there. It'll work as a starting fluid. Pop starts them really good as well. Um, and uh, it's safe for the moment. And it smells good. It, it smells good. So that's why I like it. Good product. They pay me nothing. I get nothing from them. In fact, I don't even know who makes it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think we're going to soak that a little bit and uh, get the recoil. And I think I'm just going to put it in the tank and we'll give her a go. And what we get is what we get. And then that will tell us which direction us. You understand us? I speak a Spanish. We're going to go. You know, I was thinking I was explaining to you about them saners and set net boats. And then I thought, rather than me just, you know, explaining it to you, I do live in a town that has all these boats. So I was talking to Fred, and he said, why don't you quit being a bump on a log and go down there with this camera and show these folks some of this stuff. And I thought, it ain't often Fred has a good idea, you understand. That wasn't a bad one. So what I'm going to do is go down there and show, film some of this. Want to come along? Let's go. This is a, if you can see this has got an overhead cover on it and everything. This is the Thelma C. Um, this is like a museum. Um, this would be like the very, well, a very early representation of the first generation, maybe second generation of uh, salmon saners. And, and even though, you know, it, it's got the boom and the, and the hydraulic wheel and all that, um, you can see it's tiny compared to some of them other ones. Um, and, uh, and I'll try and film the uh, the breakdown on it. it uh, it's one of Kodiak's, you know, earlier boats. And uh, I don't know if, if you can read this or not, but hopefully you can pause it and read it. It's the Kodiak Maritime Museum. And uh, they said that this boat is significant. And they wanted to make it a centerpiece. So like I said, hopefully you can pause it and read this. I'm hoping I'm getting it. And uh, this boat was built for salmon, it says here. 
Oh, there's a, a good picture. Hopefully you can see how they circle them salmon. There's the, the main boat, and there's that uh, Saner skiff I was telling you about. You see how big they, see how big? Yeah. And you can see here, North Pacific, five species of salmon return to spawn in the rivers and lakes of Kodiak. And here's some real early pictures of them doing like some beach seining and stuff. Way back. So hopefully I'm getting some of this. Alright. And then here we are again. And there they talk about fish traps. With the demise of the fish traps in the 50s, purse seining became the primary method of salmon harvesting on Kodiak. By the 1960s, when the Thelma Sea was built, new technology including hydraulic net haulers, modern diesel engines, electronic booms, sounders, radars, made seining more productive. So hopefully you see these pictures, maybe read a little bit. And uh, there's a good picture of the Thelma Sea, this boat, in her heyday, all done up and out there actually uh, on the job. Okay. The Thelma Sea was built in early 65 after Kodiak fisherman Ken Christofferson lost his salmon boat the Christine in the March 27, 1964 tsunami. So I guess this this boat was built right here locally, and there 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 it shows them actually doing you know building it, the ribs and so forth. And there she is, all done up. And it says here the earthquake built this boat. Yeah, we got hammered back there in 64, and so a lot of the boats, well, there you go. A lot of them got wiped completely out, and so they started building some here to get that fish. You remember those, uh, I told you that the big saner boats, they have a, a sane skiff that controls their nets, that haul out their big nets to circle the big schools of salmon. And uh, this, is, this is what they look like. This is uh, a saner's sane skiff. And from what I understand, the person that drives this boat really kind of has to have some skills under their belt. Um, just don't put just anybody in that boat because that's the person that's gonna seal the deal, I guess, on, on that school of fish. I've never really seen it done uh, I've seen videos of it, but uh, that, that's what, they generally have big powerful motors, I can't tell what that one is, but I'm guessing a 300, 250 or 300, and they generally have big powerful motors, and they're wide and bulky uh, skiffs, and they always put a lot of buoys and bumpers and s stuff to stop them from scuffing the main boat, that's what all that dunnage is on the front there. That's so they don't scar up the the saner, the mother boat, so to speak. And outboards, outboards, outboards. Look up there. Look down there. Woo-hoo. Money, 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 money. Here's a good example of one of those set net skiffs I was talking about. You can see he's got a big old yammy four-stroker on there. But really, the boat is just an open boat meant to go out and pick those nets and uh, throw the fish all along the bow and midsection and then take it out to that RSW. But you know, this is a bigger one. Um, they, they, they use these aluminum welded skiffs, most of them, but many of them are much smaller and won't have nothing but a 30 or 50 horse on it. This is a good example of a pick and skiff that's pretty good size. And give it a little 
exercise. Oh yeah, already getting better. All that salt out of there. Okay, now I'll spray some lube in there. And I just take it right there. Maybe a little in the cracks and crevices. The crevices and the cracks. She's free as a whistle. Okay. I primed it. I primed it. Which does work. God brought me three of them. Say, none of them run. They don't run. Need you fix them. We did an overall look at it, inspect. It looked pretty good. We did a compression check 115, 115. Fair. We did a spark check. Pop it, pop it, pop. I wouldn't stick my finger on that spark checker and pull that cord because it goes zap and hurt. Good hot spark. So, we put gas to it. Fires right up. And you said, well, you said the guy said all three of them wouldn't run. Fair. I did say that. This is very common. 
Um, at these set net site commercial fisheries, they have sometimes teenagers. They'll have four or five, six, seven skiffs to pick those nets. Inexperienced operator can't get it started. Somebody who can't even literally physically pull it good enough to get it started. They paddle back to the beach and say, this thing don't run and everything. They drop it off here, runs fine. Bad gas connections, clips, bad clips, won't let the gas through. Bad squeezy bulbs water in the tank, just all kind of things that would cause an engine to seem like it is a non-running, problematic, mechanically flawed engine out there in the field. They get here and I often find there's nothing wrong with them. Um, of course, somebody like me, I use my hose, my gas, and never will I use anybody else's tank, anybody else's hose, anybody else's fittings. I know mine are good. I know that gas is treated, is mixed properly, is not old, and if an engine's going to fire, it's going to fire. So, we looked at the plugs, they look good. Um, also, I'll get a lot of these commercial guys will drop them off in sets like this, one, two, three, and say, oh, they don't run, they're all messed up and everything. And what they're really after is just for me to go through them so that when the season starts and the fish come, they're ready to go. And so that's probably the case on this particular motor. And like I said, it was the better looking of the three. So uh, um, this one is good to go. I'll lube up the uh, transom clamps with a little grease. A little geese. Got to put the geese on it. We'll put the geese on that. You can just see I hosed her down good. I'll wipe her down a little bit inside. Any excess off of that spray lube and... Uh, and we'll get the next one in here and get to going on it. So as far as this one goes, that's going to be a wrap. And thank you for watching. More vids are coming on Inside Outboards with Cody Bass.